Well, howdy there, psychedelic investors. My name is James from Psych Biz, and today we are continuing our series of CEO AMAs. Today, we're going to be talking with the CEO of Cybin, who is, of course, Doug Drysdale. So without further ado, let's welcome the man of the hour. Doug, how are you doing today? Hey, James. Good to see you again. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a minute. We saw each other in uh, Miami in November, and wow, it's somehow been like seven months already. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. Time flies. It does. Alrighty, so let's get into this. Today we're doing, like I said in the intro, a little AMA to source the questions. We actually put on the Cybin Investors Reddit page a call for questions, and we took the top five voted questions of retail investors for Cybin. So are you ready to answer some investor questions, Doug? Yeah, then hit me with them. Let's see, what, let's see what's out there. Awesome. Let's start it up. Uh, so we'll look at the first question here, and it is from SRVB5PIZ3R. That is a difficult name to say. And he says, thanks for doing this. Can you comment on Sybin's patents? I'm specifically interested in Sybin's patents for CYB003, psilocybin, a deuterated psilocybin. Other companies have or claim to have patents covering deuterated psilocybin, and I wonder how this affects Cybin. So why don't we just start with a very brief int introduction to what CYB003 is, and then we can talk about uh, what separates it from other deuterated psilocybins. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because um, the questions about deuterated psilocybin, and of course CYB3 is not deuterated psilocybin, it's a deuterated, a deuterated analog of psilocybin. Um, <clears throat> and we've uh, specifically gone after this molecular uh, alteration to impact the pharmacokinetic profile of psilocybin, which we think has several challenges. And we demonstrated some data back in November of last year uh, that, in, at least in our preclinical models, um, confirmed some of those, those improvements, which, which we can talk about. Uh, in terms of Simon's patent portfolio, uh, we have filed 20 patents so far. Uh, we had our first patent issued in February for CYB4, which is our durative version of DMT. Uh, that's a composition of matter pattern. And of course, that's what everyone is, is that's, that's kind of the, uh, you know, the holy grail is trying to, to secure a composition of matter patterns. But that, you know, we are really ge generally looking at a layered approach to IP. So not just composition of matter, but also uh, process patterns, um, stabilization methods, uh, methods of use, uh, different indications, routes of administration, uh, different salts, uh, of, of various molecules, uh, pharmacokinetic and, and pharmacodynamic uh, properties of each of the molecules. And many of our patents are, con are under continuation because we're still generating novel data and innovative data for each of them as, as we progress through development. So we don't expect to rely on any one particular patent for protection. It'll be a range of patents and a range of claims that, that get issued. So could you perhaps just expand on uh, what a composition of matter patent is and why that is the holy grail? Yeah, the composition of matter is, is protecting this, the molecule itself. Uh, so that's the actual molecular structure, which is unique, and that's what we've been granted for CYB4. Uh, so that's a novel molecule. It's, it's inventive, hasn't been created before. Uh, and that particular patent has protection all the way out to, to 2041. So it gives us a lot of time to protect uh, the work that we're doing and, 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 and the investment that shareholders are making in the company. Okay. So just getting back to the original question, uh, which was asking how the your version your CYB003 is different from other companies that have deuterated psilocybin to repeat what you said, your or CYB003, it's not necessarily a deuterated psilocybin it's an analog of psilocybin that then has been deuterated exactly Yeah, so from the outset, we had a few, a few different approaches to tackling the pharmacokinetic challenges, you know, of psilocybin. Um, we always wanted to retain the therapeutic benefit of psilocin, but overcome the, the pharmacokinetic challenges of psilocybin. 
and that is that psilocybin, because it's a prodrug, takes quite a long time to get to peak effect, maybe an hour, an hour and a half or so. Uh, it has quite a long duration, so a treatment session might be four to six hours, <coughs> which we think is potentially challenging when it comes to scale. Um, and the pro-drug nature of psilocybin means that it has to be converted to psilocin, and we all metabolize drugs differently. And so that metabolism varies from one person to another. So we see quite a bit of interperson, interpatient variability. And that might lead to unpredictable outcomes. You know, one patient might have a moderate effect, another patient might have a, have a very profound effect with the same dosing. So those, those are three challenges that we were looking to overcome. We were trying for a faster onset, a shorter duration, and less variability. And we've, we've achieved all of those with CYB3, at least preclinically. Um, the, the onset of action of CYB3 is about twice as fast, and the duration is about half as long. So overall, patients should spend about half the time in the clinic than they would with generic psilocybin. In addition to that, uh, the, one of the benefits of deuteration is that deuteration improves both bioavailability and brain penetration. And we saw that also again in our preclinical models. We saw quite a distinct advantage in terms of plasma to brain ratio of psilocin. And so we expect in our upcoming uh, MDD study that's enrolling now uh, to have a dose, of a final efficacious dose that might be less than half of that that you would see with psilocybin. So a number of advantages and lower dosing, <clears throat> Lower dosing might mean fewer side effects when it comes to uh, looking at the profile of CYB3 in patients. Perfect. Um, so I guess we can move on to our next question here. Uh, we'll put it up on the screen. And it's from Mr. Hussar of Hummus. Great username, by the way. And he says, when do you expect to have your first drug to market? What is the timeline? And then I would also just add, which is the drug also? Yeah, so uh, the lead compound right now is CYB3, so our deuterated analog uh, of psilocybin. Um, I can give you some sort of best case estimates, but it's still a few things we don't know uh, from a regulatory perspective. Um, we are, as I mentioned, we're rolling our MDD study right now, our phase 1, 2A study. We should major have depressive study. disorder. Major depressive disorder, that's right, James. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we expect to have the first patient in the study <clears throat> this month and the first dosing likely in August. And by the end of this year, uh, we expect to see some preliminary PK data. So that will give you the first view that we'll have in patients uh, of the benefits we think we will see over generic psilocybin. So that's sort of this year. That's 2A study will read out around the middle of 2023. We'll then we then should be in a position to run uh, pivotal studies, so phase two, three studies, beginning in the fourth quarter of, of 2023. Um, and if we run those, say we run two studies in parallel, we could be finished those and ready to file an NDA uh, as soon as late 2025. Uh, and that's, oh, okay. assuming, that's assuming that that's the regulatory pathway. There are still some unknowns uh, and we will get some insight into these unknowns in the coming months as maps it moves forward <coughs> with that regulatory filing. Excuse me, James. <coughs> this is me just have some water. No worries. <clears throat> so as maps moves forward with their um their uh, progress through phase three and regulatory filings, and as Compass discloses their phase three design and we some of the see some of the secondary endpoints that maybe FDA is asking for or some of the long term follow up uh, requirements that FDA is asking for in that design. Uh, or when we see the size of a required safety database, which may mean the need for additional studies to add patient exposures, that might add to the overall timeline. Uh, but, in, but in general, I could say from where we're sitting today, best case scenario is an NDA filing towards the end of 2025. And that would probably mean that if, assuming this best case scenario happens, you file the NDA in 2025, we would be looking at maybe end of 2026 before it starts actually being used in clinics, or would it be longer than that shorter than that yeah typically 10 to 12 months for an approval that's right okay that makes sense and then so end of 2026 maybe another couple of years one year uh if things go slower than we want i think we'll have some good clarity um as we get through the next quarter or so i'm hoping that we can take some learnings from uh, the pathway that MAPS is being guided to and Compass is being guided to by FDA. And of course, uh, that's one of the benefits of being a fast follower is we can, we can learn from, from those, uh, those interactions.
Awesome. Uh, so before we move on to the next question, uh, I was just curious if there's any plans uh, bringing in the discussion of Kernel Flow, which is, of course, a company you're working with that's using a helmet that scans the brain when a person is on a psilocybin or on a psychedelic experience you're currently using with ketamine. But I was curious if there's ever any plans to use it with CYB003 in these clinical trials or whether that would be something that would happen two, three, four years from now. Yeah, it's possible that we will use it. Um, you might know we're in the middle of a, a, a feasibility study uh, using the kernel flow device. Uh, we we did share <clears throat> a couple of months ago some data from a single subject uh, that saw um, clear changes in, in the brain following a ketamine session. And then we saw those changes, those connectivity changes, slowly fade away over a number of days. So that was one subject. Uh, we, we've been enrolling the entire study and uh, we expect to have data from that study um, at least before year end, maybe a little sooner. And once we see the results from that, we'll get an idea of what we can see and what we can learn from the kernel flow device. Uh, and once we've, once we've looked at that data, then we can assess at what point we might use that in some of our regulatory studies going forward. It's uh, a, little, a little early to say, mm -hmm. and that, that's really the purpose of this ongoing study is to assess the feasibility uh, of kernel flow to be a useful device, quantitative device in some of these registry studies. Well, I really hope it works because the more we can find out about the brain, either in interaction with psychedelics or even sans psychedelics, then it's still a huge plus for science. Yeah, I agree. I think what we've seen so far is already very interesting and, and there are clearly changes going on during a psychedelic experience that we can track uh, during and after. And so if we can find utility for those measures uh, from a regulatory perspective, you know, then we'll certainly look at using kernel flow if it makes sense. Fantastic. And I think we can move on to the next question. So this is coming from Avredit, and he says at one point, I believe that Intel Jet... Intel Gen X was provide. I don't know if I'm saying that company's name right or not. Intel Gen X was providing Cybin with film strips containing your proprietary molecules for trials being conducted in Jamaica. Please check me on that. Uh, being that a Thai invested in Intel Gen X, from my understanding, that came to an end. Is there any plans for revisiting dosing trial participants with your molecules utilizing film strips provided by another manufacturer in the future? So I guess let's break this down, this question down into two parts. First of all, can we confirm that uh, Cybin no longer has a relationship with Intel Gen X? Yeah, so maybe, look, I, I think I've sort of partially answered this already in that uh, we were looking at a number of different ways to solve for the PK issues with psilocybin. Um, two of those approaches were using formulations. Uh, one was a sublingual film formulation with Intelgenics. Another was a fast dissolving tablet that we were working on in parallel. And the third approach was ended up in CYB3, it was a molecular approach, but all trying to deal with the same issues, right? Onset, durability, variability, duration and variability. Um, we've clearly shown now that, um, that CYB3 using that molecular part is able to deliver the benefits that we were looking for in addition to lower dosing. So CYB3 is already bioavailable and has um, improved brain penetration. So as a result of that, there's no need to pursue buckle delivery, like sub sublingual film delivery. There's just no advantage to that because instead of trying to solve the problems of psilocybin using formulation, we've solved it molecularly. So short answer is that we, we're, we're prioritizing CYB3, and there's uh, no no current plans to develop sublingual films. Okay, so just to summarize that to make sure that I understand it completely, when you were looking at sublingual films with Intel Gen X, you were simultaneously investigating different pathways to bring a psilocybin or psilocybin analog, deuterated psilocybin, which have you. You were looking at different pathways to get that to uh, improve upon the pharmacokinetics and other issues. And it turns out, based on your own research, that a molecular form deuterated psilocybin analog, CYB003, was a better uh, delivery compound, delivery method than the sublingual film. So that's no longer something that is in the Cybin's, in Cybin's uh, plans going forward. I get that more or less right? Yeah, that's a good summary, James. Awesome. Uh, so I guess with that, unless you have anything else to add, we can move on to the next question. Okay, let's do that. Perfect. 
All right, this comes from Mia Holly. She says, Sybin recently acquired Entheon's Phase 1 DMT trial. Can you explain how this will help the development process of CYB004, which, as you already said, is a deuterated DMT? I heard it will accelerate its development by nine months, but I'm a little bit confused. Does Sybin not need to still run a Phase 1 clinical trial for CYB004 since it's as a deuterated compound, it's a different drug that needs to be tested for safety in human. Thank you. Yeah, that's, this is a really good question. Um, so yes, the CYB4 preclinical package, that work is ongoing. And much of the work involves comparing CYB4 to generic DMT in various models, uh, both IV and inhaled. So we're building a PK modeling database, if you like, of comparison, comparing CYB4 to DMT. Now, while that work is ongoing, uh, we're fortunate to be able to have access to generic DMT, which we can test in humans. And we were planning to do this in any case ourselves, uh, but in, as an alternative, we decided to acquire the ongoing study from, from Entheon. <clears throat> Our own study would have started around September, October, uh, Entheon's study started at the beginning of the year, so that's a clear nine months or so uh, of head start. But the real advantage for us is that there's not a lot of public detailed information on dosing DMT. Um, if you give DMT in, uh, through an injection or delivered nasally, for example, it's broken down really, really quickly in the body. So when you infuse DMT intravenously, uh, it's getting broken down as fast as you can put it in. Right, so you've got to find the right dynamic for keeping patients in that DMT space. And that involves an initial bolus of drug followed by an infusion at a certain rate. What is um, a bolus? A bolus is an initial sort of load, if you like, of, of DMT to get a patient into the DMT space. And then the infusion kind of helps keep them there. What we don't have details on for this study is exactly how much that bolus should be, how much to give and how much to infuse over what time frame to keep a patient in that DMT space. So this is a, this study is quite a large study. It's 50 healthy volunteers um, over five cohorts with escalating doses. And through that, we will learn a lot about the dosing dynamics and dose optimization of, of, of DMT. So then we'll have human data uh, using DMT and we'll have preclinical animal models using comparing DMT with CYB4. So when we come to the first in human study with CYB4, instead of having to do those explorations with CYB4, it'll be more of a confirmatory study, a confirming study, comparing CYB4 and DMT, because we'll have a lot of human data already, rather than having to start from scratch with CYB4. So that's gonna save us an awful lot of time. And it's quite a unique situation to be able to do this work in parallel uh, and not have to wait until CYP4 is ready to go into humans. So we felt that this was a good use of our capital. And uh, if we can accelerate the <clears throat> program by three quarters, that's a, you know, a good saving in terms of time and then obviously burn as well. Okay, so that helps me a lot trying to understand this because I was actually a little bit confused also. So <laughs> the long story short, the reason that it's uh, accelerating the process by around nine months is because you would have had to do a regular DMT study anyhow before doing your CYB004 study. So now that you're able to uh, acquire this DMT study, which is already almost finished, I'm not really sure the uh, the state that it's at. It's already almost finished? Do, do I have that? No, correct? we'll have the last patient, last subject, sorry, uh, into the study uh, around the October timeframe. Okay. Uh, but then when that's finished, you'll be able to move directly into your phase one clinical trial for CYB004, and you'll be able to look at the data of that compared to the uh, X entheon study that you've acquired? Yeah, it's a lot of learnings, a lot of human dosing learnings that we'll have. And so we'll be a lot better informed when we go into our first in human mm -hmm. CYP4 study. I won't we'll be starting from scratch. And that's important because this is one of the very first clinical trials that's actually into DMT. Like I know small pharma has one, maybe a couple private companies have one, but this is still like within the first five phase one clinical trials when it comes to DMT, correct? Yeah, it's a very, it's one of the very few studies and it's quite large. I think it's the largest mm -hmm. phase one study. 50 healthy volunteers is a lot of, uh, a lot of folks. These are also smokers as well, incidentally, uh, which uh, may give us some efficacy signals we will see. But our, our main goal is to really learn about those dosing dynamics and translate that into CYB4. 
Awesome. And then just really quickly, how does CYB004 differ, uh, differ from regular DMT? So again, it's deuterated. Uh, so that means we've substituted certain hydrogen atoms on the molecule with deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen. And that has the benefit of improving, as with CYB3, it improves bioavailability and improves uh, brain penetration. So what we've seen in our preclinical work uh, is a significant increase in bioavailability over regular DMT, both uh, oral uh, and uh, inhaled. Actually, and could you just uh, define what that means, bioavailability? Yeah, it's how much of the drug actually gets into uh, and is available in, in the bloodstream. If you take DMT orally, it's pretty much immeasurable. Uh, in, in, in plasma uh, because it's just not it's not getting in, in there. It's broken down very, very quickly. Um, if you give uh, DMT IV, then of course it's available because it's immediately in the blood. Uh, we've shown that we can deliver uh, CYB4, uh, both IV and inhaled in our animal models and, and deliver a similar bioequivalence or plasma levels as you would see through giving DMT IV. So, so that's just quite an interesting, interesting advantage. We've also shown that we can extend the half-life of DMT through deuteration by about 300%. So instead of being, if you say gave this uh, nasally or through an injection, instead of DMT, it might, might be a five to 10 minute uh, session because it's broken down so quickly. Slowing the breakdown using deuteration means that we, we think our, our treatment session might be 20 to 30 minutes long. So perhaps long enough for patients to be in a therapeutic state rather than an aggressive five or 10 minutes. Um, and that might impact the durability of any effects that we see, um, but also still very scalable. Patients could be in and out of the clinic realistically within within an hour. So we think that's, that's, that's very interesting. Could you perhaps just expand on that a little bit? Because that's part of the reason that I personally am really excited about the potential for both regular DMT, but then also uh, variations of DMT. Why is its shorter duration important for scalability and then also perhaps accessibility? Well, of course, uh, all the time that a patient has to spend in the clinic, whether it's getting ready for their session, uh, waiting for their dose to, to kick in, uh, the treatment session itself, or any kind of follow-up after, all of that adds to the total time and total cost of treatment because that requires a clinic and staffing, observation, you name it, and, and a number of headcount around it. Um, and those just increase the, the cost. And the, the more expensive these uh, ancillary costs are, the fewer uh, patients are likely to have coverage when it comes to insurance and reimbursement. So it'll, it'll limit somewhat um, access to these treatments. So one of the benefits of DMT is that it has a very rapid onset of action. Uh, patients are in a DMT space literally within seconds. Uh, so there's no real waiting around at the beginning. Um, we, and, and also once DMT uh, starts to get broken down, within 10 minutes after, it's no longer measurable in the plasma. So we'll have to do some driving tests and a few other things like that. But it seems to me that patients should be able to go back to their day after the session because the DMT is broken down so quickly. So if the, with those two things, the onset and offset being very rapid, if we can keep the treatment uh, duration itself short enough to be scalable and certainly within a regular sort of uh, clinic visit or doctor's visit time frame, then that's something that the healthcare system can quite easily adapt to because it's adapted to many other treatments like that. Uh, so a 20 to 30 minute session we think is very scalable, very manageable, and should allow clinics to see multiple patients a day and keep the overall cost of these treatments uh, keep, keep them down. And then just one last follow-up question on CYB004, and then I guess also DMT in general. Do you have a general idea already of how large of a dose patients should receive? Are we talking about a very low dose or a large dose that would be known in like kind of psychedelic culture as a breakthrough dose? Yeah, so we that's, this is part of the work we're doing both preclinically and with DMT um, is to determine what that dose uh, optimization will be and what the dose curve might, might look like. Uh, so one of the benefits of, of performing this DMT study in the Netherlands is it is an escalating dose study. So we'll be able to determine when, we, when and how we get patients into that DMT space and, and how long we keep them there for. So this is a big, important part of the early development of any, any uh, treatment. And it's an important part of what we're doing with CYB3. This first study is also determining the dose curve and what the effective dose might be. It's kind of the foundation of future pivotal studies. 
Fantastic. Uh, let's move on to what I believe is the last question, although I might have miscounted. There might be one uh, hidden after that, but I think this is number five. And it says, how is trying to fund your business during this recession? Getting a drug to market now must be difficult. So I'm going to just modify that a little bit because we're not necessarily definitely in a recession yet. So let's uh, expand that definition to include just the downturn in biotech stocks in general. So uh, it, are, are you finding it's difficult, Sybin, right now to raise capital? Is that something you've been looking at? Uh, just as a little bit of background information, as of your last uh, financial filing, you guys had just shy of $54 million cash, Canadian. And then in the year, you used in uh, cash use and operating activities, $45 million uh, thereabouts. Uh, so you're, you're using about as much money in a year, a little less, as you've got in the bank right now. So what is the plan when it comes to raising capital going forward? Yeah, that's right. We've got a good solid 12 months of runway uh, ahead of us. Uh, so we'll certainly want to look at raising capital within the next 12 months. Uh, we have a lot of capitalists, uh, catalysts coming up in that time frame. Uh, in particular, this PK data that's coming from our CYB3 study around the end of this year, which we think uh, will demonstrate benefits over generic psilocybin. So certainly in the next 12 months, we'll have to look at the capital markets again. You know, uh, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's necessarily a bad time to raise in capital. Um, we don't necessarily like the price <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that the shares are at today, but there's an awful lot of investor interest. You know, when I look around um, and speak to biotech investors, they're quite excited about where prices are. <clears throat> and I think you can see that in the XBI, which is up 18% in the last 30 days. Um, so maybe that's a sign that, that uh, you know, biotech investors are paying attention. Uh, biotech financings are ongoing. Uh, we've seen a number of those in recent weeks. We've seen a few M&A deals happening. Um, Cybin stock is up in the last 30 days, frankly. You know, but when we speak to investors um, about Cybin specifically, you know, we're still above our go public price, which we're happy to say, um, unlike some of our peers. Um, but compared to when we went public 18 or 19 months ago, we have more capital on the balance sheet than we had at that time. Uh, we've got IP issued uh, and, and a lot of IP pending. Uh, we've got a full team in place. Uh, we've got an ecosystem of vendors and partners that are DEA scheduled and licensed, which takes some time to build. Uh, we've got molecules in the clinic. Uh, so we massively de-risked our programs and yet our, our, uh, our, our stock price is around about where we went public. So I, I would say that we're, we're a pretty good, pretty good buy right now. So like, I think there's lots of doom and gloom in the media. Uh, when you talk to bankers, um, they're not necessarily getting uh, the number of, amount of deal flow that they would like and maybe the fees that they would like. Um, but when we talk to biotech investors, uh, we're not seeing the same doom and gloom. We're, they're seeing buying opportunities. So just to summarize that then, uh, you, you will have to raise capital again sometime in the next 12 months. And you, the primary hope is that by the time you have to do that, you'll have released some positive data, which should, if the market was rational, uh, increase the stock price because the probability of Sybin succeeding long-term would have gone up. But even if the market isn't rational and the stock prices remain where they're at right now, Sybin is still in a good position to raise capital going forward. Of course, it would be nicer if the stock price was higher, but that's not necessarily a concern on your end. Yeah, that's right. I'll also add to that, James, that, you know, in addition to our clinical programs, we have a, a, a discovery platform uh, that is ongoing, continues to generate new molecules and IP outside of our clinical programs. Uh, we've had a number of uh, meetings with very large pharmaceutical companies that are very interested in this space. So there's also the potential of partnerships along the way as well, which we remain very open to. So we're looking at all avenues, as you'd expect us to do as a management team. Um, but uh, I have no concerns about raising capital at this point in time. Okay. Do you think that, uh, and obviously you wouldn't be able to speak to specifics, but uh, are mergers and acquisitions in the future for Cybin? You just bought this one clinical trial. Could we be seeing anything else or being excited for anything else going forward? And I'm sure you'll have to give a very vague answer, but... Yeah, and look, I, I think we're always looking, you know, and um, I have a background in, in M&A, so it's sort of in my nature, if you like, to be looking. Um, we're not necessarily looking to add additional programs. We have the uh, discovery platform and we have two clinical programs 
if that's that you know we want to focus our, our, our spending on those um, but we are always looking at other opportunities that might add data to our programs or they might add IP or they might remove you know an IP or bring in IP that could be challenging um, or accelerate uh, work that we're doing or bring synergy with other organizations where we could re overall reduce costs you know so we're always looking at things from that perspective how can we be more efficient in bringing our programs forward in, in many different ways uh, so yeah we'll always be uh, open and opportunistic Fantastic. So I think that was the last question. If it wasn't, we'll have another one pop up on the screen here. But I think that was the last question. Um, so is there anything else that you just wanted to convey to retail investors? Yeah, like I said, I think uh, the last 18 or 19 months, uh, we've done a massive amount of uh, de-risking of the business. And yet, uh, you know, our stock price is about where it was when we went public. So that's, a, I think, a good buy for, for investors at this point in time. Uh, I'm very excited about the next several months. Um, moving from the bench to the clinic in about 18 months is pretty rapid. And uh, to be bringing in our first patients in our depression study, uh, begin first dosing in the next uh, month or so, and um, uh, to get to the point by the end of the year where we're able, to, we hope to validate our CYB3 thesis and uh, we can we show this improved pharmacokinetics over generic psilocybin. We think that's, you know, that's a real validation of the programs. You know, typically at that stage of, uh, of drug development, um, things wouldn't be quite as exciting because everyone would be waiting for efficacy data. But I think at this point, we are all pretty confident that psilocybin or psilocin uh, is efficacious. Um, so, you know, we're making that, that assumption, of course, based on all the data that's out there. So uh, if we can show differentiation uh, in, the, in the PK profile and those benefits uh, that it brings to patients and payers and physicians, then I think that's, that, that's an exciting endpoint we can look to around the end of this year. So pulling on that thread a little bit, if at the end of this year or whenever it ends up happening, you do release uh, data that shows that CYB003 is either more effective or more uh, uh, usable, uh, than regular psilocybin. Do you think that puts psilocybin in the driver's seat, the number one position, at least when it comes to psilocybin? I think it puts us in a really exciting position. You know, we might well be the fast follower uh, in, in the space with psilocybin overall, or at least an analog of psilocybin. But if, we, if we're fast following with an improved asset, I think that makes us a very attractive uh, investment. And, you know, something, you know, I think then leading the space, at least technologically, I guess. And do you think that there will be space for uh, multiple different versions of psilocybin? Or do you think this is going to be a winner takes all? Whichever psilocybin ends up being the most effective will eat up the entire market. No, I don't think there's a winner takes all here in, in with any of the molecules or any of the conditions, frankly. We know from history that there's no one size fits all uh, with mental health patients. And some, some patients uh, do better with one treatment versus another. We may have patients that do very well with CYB3 and others that do better with CYB4. And there's a lot of overlap between depression and anxiety, uh, et cetera. So I, don't, I do think there's enough room for competition or different alternatives and choices. Um, in the hypertension market, we saw a half a dozen ACE inhibitors. In the SSRI market, we saw a half a dozen, a half a dozen or so different competitors all, that all did pretty well. Um, so I, look, I do think at the end of the day, the product profile will out and may lead to greater access, greater market share. Uh, but I think there's, there's certainly room for more than one, one version of these things. Fantastic. And I think that that is as good a place as anywhere to end it. Uh, where can people learn more about Cybin? Uh, please look us up at Cybin.com. Thank Perfect. you, James. Thank you for being on today, Doug. Chat Thanks, James. Good to see you again. Take care.